Okay, so yeah, officially. Uh, okay, welcome everyone. This is the first semester of this uh, colloquium, PhD colloquium on machine learning and data-driven modeling. And I'm very happy that this semester we have a lot of new faces from a lot of domain expertise, different fields of domain expertise. And yeah, I hope you would like it also. So w first thing I would like to say is that uh, this semester will be a bit a combination of applications with, with theories and techniques. And if you go back to the previous uh, slides from the last semesters and some of the videos are online, you will see that like they are sometimes just about uh, techniques. And so I decided to have this kind of uh, application-oriented presentation of machine learning. Because what we hear nowadays is like machine learning is a kind of hype. And I think if you attend even to architectural conferences this year, people were interested to use uh, machine learning. But I think I would say mainly it's because of Google and similar companies. They introduce this very easy to use and eye-catchy uh, applications. And then usually at the end, the, what is important is that, okay, what was the question? And of course this is cool, but is it that really a, a nice engineering or practical questions that an expert would ask and be approached by machine learning? So this semester I want to challenge first of all myself and uh, it would be great if you can bring these things uh, to table uh, from your domain expertise to bring the applications that you know. And then from the other side, I try to push it with machine learning techniques and I think these machine learning techniques are kind of universal way of thinking about problems in many fields. And maybe I should explain a bit about my background also, that I'm a systems engineer originally. So systems engineering, in my opinion, is not a discipline. So you learn a lot of techniques, and then you always try to move like a nomad in different fields and try to find problems that you can solve. And I think now, in my opinion, and the way I'm going to talk about machine learning, will be like that, that I'm looking across the field. So the first session, of which is today, I will just talk about kind of what is machine learning, what is the main shift, and so on. And then the next sessions, we will go through the theories and applications one by one. And all, all of these slides are available online, and then we'll be always in Python. So we run the codes, we get the codes. Even if we have the data, it's about how to get the data. We show you how to get the data, and then it would be great that you also test it because sometimes what happens is that you just look at it when I'm running the codes but since it's a short uh, session and if you are busy with your PhD then it's it's not possible to work and then you don't learn it enough so first of all I think we all agree that nowadays we have a lot of great stories from computer vision natural language processing and for example you know this kind of self-driving cars which are in the media and so on and these are if you think about it technically they're really uh, uh, important contributions. And because of that, we have a hype around machine learning in many fields. But I think, in my opinion, still there's a big questions what to do and which kind of good applications that we can do with machine learning. So in principle, this is my research, and I'm interested to push it in this direction. So I've been collaborating with many groups during the last, in principle, 10 years. And this is uh, what I'm going to show you also. So for example, this, this kind of applications is called, for example, semantic segmentation. We will talk about it hopefully one session. And the idea is that you have a picture and real time, and then you want to teach a machine to detect the labels or uh, uh, label the pixels. And if you think about it as one frame, just one frame by a frame, each frame has like thousands of uh, pixels. And you need to learn how to cluster them spatially and say, okay, this is a car, this is this, this is that. And technically, it has been a very, very hard problem. But now you have this kind of uh, things that easily you can run this, and even sometimes in a mobile phone. And then this guy, for example, this was a breakthrough, I think in 2013, that they can do it real time. So real time, you see that, I don't know if it's, is it visible enough or not, but you see that it detects all of them, it labels them, and it localizes them, and this is called, for example, semantic segmentation. And I will try to show this, and then on top of that, I will show you which kind of other applications that you can do with semantic segmentation that you can't imagine, for example, like topology optimization. In order to speed up topology optimization, you can think about it as a kind of semantic segmentation, or flood simulations, whatever. These are all possible things, and these technologies are very generic. 
but the question is that you need to learn how to connect them to the question or for example this kind of fun applications that maybe i don't know if you know or you have seen it before we have this kind of uh, there's a big data set that uh, is a kind of a crowd crowd based data set that they ask people to draw for example a bird or draw an ambulance for example and then what they record is that they just record the movement of the pen and then when it's lifted, right? So in principle, you have a three-dimensional data set, x, y in time, and then when you lift, it's zero, for example. Then it says it moves the density. And then they collected a lot of them, and now they, you train in kind of deep learning network, which is a kind of a recurrent neural network. And then the idea is that, is, is it possible if I start with a line that this this machine is going to complete it like an ambulance, for example. If you train a neural network with a lot of ambulances, what happens? So, for example, they did this just for fun. It's not a very uh, complicated application, but technically it's really hard because it's not any longer about uh, uh, predicting a time series. It's about the whole concept of, for example, an ambulance. So, for example, if you do like this, and, okay, it doesn't work, start over. And this is a work done by Google Group, and there's a, a Japanese guy, which is amazing what he's doing. So if you do it like that, so this machine now is completing this for you, and every time is a kind of randomized pattern. This is a train neural network trained for ambulances. So it's not about the concept of ambulance or what, but what is interesting is that here, it is in a long-term problem how to have a long-term memory, because what this method is doing is that it takes x, y, and then predicts what is the next x, y. And if you think about it like a time series prediction in stock market, you are, you are always interested to know what is the next price in the market. But here, we are not interested to know what is the next price in the market, for example, or the value. But we are interested to know if it learns at the end to draw an ambulance. And you see that every time is different. So these are, this is a very fun application, but actually technically is a very, very hard problem that has been solved recently. And, and there are a lot of them. But every time if you show this to like architects or artists and they call it generative art, usually architects, it's not interesting because it's not there yet. And this is actually a very big question that whether we can use machine learning for generations or not, this is another question that we can talk later. Or for example, you have this kind of applications and think about is just this algorithm is learning to interpolate the pixel values and imagine when you have a picture of 100 by 100 by 100 in principle you have 10,000 dimensional data sets and then now it, it learns that if you give this picture and this picture it fills it in between for you so and look at the quality these are all synthetic and like generated interpolations so here the idea is that how to capture the invariances and then this is the whole deep learning movement so to learn that there's a high dimension manifold and if you learn that high dimension manifold on that in that space you can do linear interpolations so you have this picture you have this picture this method converts them to a vector in a let's say 200 dimensional space and then if you do linear interpolation and go back again to the original space, which is the space of this picture, it, it fills you for it fills it for you. And look at this for example transitions from here to here. And or for example, this is one person and the the whole contribution of the society in this machine learning society was to think about how to capture rotation invariance. Because in principle for us as a human it's easy to say, okay, this side of the face, the other side of the face but how you can teach a machine to generate in between without any uh, parametric setup. That's the whole thing. And these results are amazing, but it's still very controversial because nobody knows in principle what to do. You can use these, for example, take uh, data from building facade and then generate in between. I think you have seen these kind of applications in related to architecture, but I don't know if it's a really architecture about these kind of things. So still, we are just very shallow. Or for example, you can do, again, this kind of method. It's called GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks. And then this is a model generated. They're all synthetic. None of them are real. But the data is generated from a lot of portraits from 19th century. So maybe this guy is a bit familiar for some of you. But in principle, they are all like 
synthetic. So but just think about it that and th try to connect it to your context. For example, if you're working with a graph, you usually you, you, you play a lot with the parameters in your graph, which is an, a structure or whatever, and then you want to come up with a new form, for example. These are all new forms. In they are not new forms in because you have a certain topology, but they are all unique, and you can generate a lot of them. So, yeah, this is just interesting in terms of techniques, but yeah, it's in, it would be interesting to think about it that during this uh, semester, how we can use this kind of very powerful techniques to, to, I would say, a lot of applications. So now these are the, what's happening in the media, and usually these are the results from uh, computer scientists or computer vision society. And if you go to these conferences, there is no discussion a lot about the applications, but it's just mainly about the contributions, how you can solve this high dimensional problem. But what is for me interesting and I would like to share with you and hopefully you, you bring it back also from your side is that w how this will change engineering, for example, how this will change the uh, idea of design or whether it, it can change at all or not. And these kind of questions. So now in this, uh, today I will just talk about this, uh, this kind of shifts and what is happening in principle. And for example, if you're in, involved, if we have been involved in the field of computational modeling, and you, you want to answer why this is happening now, because actually these methods are not, a lot of them are not conceptually new. For example, you can track them back to 18th century, 15th century, 16th century, some of them. But now, why this is happening now? So one way is to look at these developments in computational technologies, for example, before invention of like modern computations or modern computers, we had usually analytical ap uh, approaches, right? So you need to solve something analytically. And then if you cannot solve it analytically, you need to do it uh, numerically. So these numerical methods have been there from Newton, for example, at the time of Newton also. But now with the computations, we could we were able to do it faster and faster. So we had the first wave of mainframe computing from 1950s. And this is the time that most of the computational models are around the so-called centralized models, like uh, gravitational models or differential equations and so on. And then you reach to a certain limit of uh, representation with these centralized models. And then we have the second wave, which is like agent-based models, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with, or like uh, cellular automata models, that you're kind of dis distributed models. And this exactly corres uh, correspond very well with the invention of like introduction of uh, internet, PCs and then networks of computations. And then over time, we have this notion of uh, social media, for example, or ubiquitous computing, that nowadays data is being generated with the res as, a as a result of daily activities which are digital. So now, let's say from 2010 afterwards, we have these notions like big data, for example. And the big data is one of the main reasons, for example, now we can solve these kind of problems. Because before, if you wanted to do this, you need a lot of labeled data, but you didn't have the labeled data. Now, recently, we have a lot of labeled data, and then we have a lot of new computing technologies. For example, these are usually very expensive classically, but now, for example, these deep neural networks are, uh, are easily possible to be implemented with GPUs, for example, and this was for the, for the first time in 2010. So these are the main steps that they use GPUs for parallel processing of these uh, kind of deep learning networks that I will talk about it later, like convolutional neural networks and so on. And it, at the same time, with this uh, abundance of big data everywhere, I think maybe this is one of the reasons why this is happening. But even there is a there is no clear reason why nowadays, because these methods that we are going to talk, techniques and methods are mainly from 1970s, 1960s and so on. So, so, and I will. I would like to also show you another way of uh, testing this kind of uh, questions. And for example, if I say here we have centralized models like differential equations, and if we have here we have decentralized models like uh, uh, cellular automata, and here we have this co the so-called machine learning, you can test it with again a kind of data-driven way which is, uh, for example, in this case, if you're not familiar, this is a project called Google Ngram. I don't know if you know this. Everybody knows or nobody knows, okay. Google Ngram was a project in Google. They, they scanned 
I think around 5 million or maybe more books from 1800 up to 2008 and they just simply counted number of grams so one gram is like hello is one gram for example I am is two grams and then you can do it n grams and so they did it up to for example 10 grams right so now you have this data set and then you can play with that in a kind of uh, backward way so for example you I have these assumptions that these are like three main trends and I want to check it so now you can ask this and they have the very nice a API so you can check differential equations cellular automata and machine learning and then it just gives you the number of times that these tr n-grams have been in any of these books. So it just counts them. So it just follows the hype. So it tells you what is the hype. So if you do that for this uh, uh, date, this keywords, now you have these patterns. Like differential equations, they're very old, even before 1800. And they go to this peak, and this is exactly 1960s. This is the beginning of computation, mainframe computing. And you, if you, I, uh, this was part of my PhD. There is a lot of failure stories here, and then you have again PCs, and then abundance of like everybody has a computer, and now they started the game, but it goes down. So it, when it goes down, it doesn't mean that it's not useful any longer, but it's stable. It's not hype any longer. So. And then if you look at, for example, cellular automata, which is a, a relatively smaller, I mean, it's not that h a big contribution, but it's exactly this time, 1980s to up to 2000, and still many use it for many applications, for example. And then if you look at machine learning, it's just started, let's say, 1960s, you had some hypes, and like some peaks, and then it goes up, and then, then you have this dark time of machine learning during 1990s. This is the time that people say it didn't work because the idea was wrong. And then now they say it didn't work because we didn't have the data on computational power. And then again after 2010, it, it goes up. So you can play with this with any questions that you have. For example, if you're working on a topic and if you want to know how old is the topic or if you want to follow the market, you can check it here also. This is possible. And another way to look at the, this uh, phenomenon, I would say, is that to think about what is the main shift. The main shift, for example, I didn't go through these differential equations, but in principle, of oh, cellular automata is that, in principle, we can call them a kind of, uh, we have a kind of spectrum from theory-driven models to data-driven models that you have machine learning here. And the classical methods, I would say, we can call them theory-driven, that it means that you usually start with a certain rule or theory that you know in advance. Somehow it could be also the result of some other studies, and then you try to hard code them, for example, simple thing. Think about Newton's equations. We know that all of these gravitational rules. And then you, when you want to make a computational model of uh, Newton's equations, you simply hard code this into your system, and then you solve it numerically. For example, you say, if the force is like this, what happens? Right? So you, you need a lot of theories in advance, and these theories always are based on some kind of representation of the reality. So if you think about this diagram, that here is a complexity of the systems that we want to model, and complexity could be a function of real number of relations and number of attributes of the systems. For example, if you go to the societal systems, it becomes very complex, because there you really don't know if there is a system at all, for example, in a city, the way cities are working. And if you go to a very simple, static, very, very, very isolated setup, you have a simple system because you have few parameters, right? That, so this is one axis. And the other one is the, the level of uh, generalization that, for example, if the system is very simple, you can come up with a rule. And this is a classical uh, science, I would say, hardcore science, that you say, OK, I found that these things works like that in nature. So this is a classical science that you discover something, and then you say, this is the theory. But then you can generalize it, and then you can use it to other applications. But when the system gets complex, then you have local and temporal models. Here you have global models. When you go to the complex setup, you have local and temporal models. Because there are a lot of unique cases that you can, this is your question, but it doesn't make sense, and it, there is no a priori, a priori theory for that. So this is the time that you need to think about, you need to gather a lot of data. And then since there is no theory, then you need to find a way to put them together towards your questions. This is the idea of data-driven modeling. And then you can think about it like a uh, spectrum. 
then there is no problem to, f to fight against each other. Simply you just say, for example, in this case, you see, like, think about it, energy simulations, right? You have building energy simulators which are, which are based on these theories, like navier stokes equations. So you just run them based on CFD, which is a, another problem, which is a computational complexity. But now think about that you want to build a city-level energy model. So you need to think about all of these buildings in isolations, and you need to build models for each of them. And now think about cars. And then how people drive in one city and how people drive in other cities. How do you want to encode this in your code? If, if still, you say everything is physical because I want to, for example, model uh, heat. I want to model urban heat effects, heat island effects, or I want to know what is the energy consumption in this area. Then there are a lot of uh, complex patterns, complex problems, that there is no one single uh, t uh, theory for that. And it doesn't make sense to make a theory for that. And it's still, there are people who are doing that. They say, OK, we studied this in, for example, let's say I was there in Singapore, in this region, and then we specifically focus on these type of people in these types of housing and so on. So it's becoming useless. Because then you say, OK, what's happening is that you're going to this direction, but what's happening is that you're reducing the complexity of the reality. So it's not there any longer, and it's a kind of uh, problem. What is happening with m uh, machine learning is that, in principle, it inverts this problem. Because it's not any longer depending on the theory, and this is the learning part. You write a code that learns the whatever the co rule is in between. So you go to a specific context in a local and temporal space, in this space and time uh, context, and then you just say, what is the question there? You collect a lot of data around that question, and then leave it to this learning machine, and it learns the rules. And then you know that you cannot easily generalize it somewhere else. So this can question could be translation from German to English. It could be German to Russian. It's a question. And if you think about it classically, you need to write down all of these grammatical things in a kind of if-then rules. And here, with machine learning, it works. And your Google Translate works like that. They don't know the, the language. They just learn to. Uh, answer this a specific question. If the sentence is this, what would be the answer? And it's a kind of probabilistic model. So if you think about it, again, again, another way of thinking about this shift is that this is a classical science. Even if it's data driven, you have data sets, and you always assume that you need to find the rule. And then, you, of course, if you can do this for many applications, you can publish in Nature, and you're very successful in principle. But Usually, <laughs> it's not a good case because it always goes to this direction, which is not the real, real world problem. And but this is a classical way. And if you start as an start like a classical engineering uh, program, after four years you know a lot of lines, and you are an expert. So in principle, expert is a person who knows the answers for known questions. So you have a typical questions, and then you learn how to solve them, and then you say, "I'm an expert in this field." Right? And then if you go to the uh, further steps, you try to say, OK, this is another question. I want to find the rule for that. There, so one paper, Nature Publications, I'm an expert also. So this is the way it works. Where in machine learning, in principle, this is a promise, and I really believe in that, is that you really forget about one line. You play with any line. Because when you do that, you introduce a lot of exceptions. Here you have the notion of outlier. And think about norms in societies, for example. And this is, in principle, a kind of democratic society, that you always vote, and then say, OK, there is one line. But here is another kind of thing that I don't know what would be the corresponding setup for the, like a society. But here, there are any lines. So you can argue that sometimes that is a kind of quantum setup, that from any angle that you look, there is a description for that. So it's not just one one line, one, one rational line, which is a kind of one answer. There could be any answer. And this is the case for not for this simple uh, setup, for complex problems that we, we, we feel a lot, there are a lot around us. So in principle, this is my claim as a systems engineer, because I have been always talking with experts, and I always said I'm not an expert. So if this is true, in principle, with this data-driven modeling, we are abstracting from expertise. So because you say, I can learn the expertise. Actually, I don't learn the expertise. My machine learning algorithm learns the expertise. 
if this expertise is translation from one language to another one, if this expertise is how to solve static questions, if it's a question of, I don't know, uh, build the flow of water or so water, whatever. If you give me enough data, these models are strong enough and they can find what would be the potential rules for that. So it's a kind of inversion. So in principle, this is a kind of freedom for me as a systems engineer because I think the classical systems engineering failed in 1980s, but I don't want to go to that direction. So if you have this classical uh, division in science that, or let's call it domain domains or disciplines, that we have people working on structure, water, economy, energy, and look at ETA is like that, right? So you have these divisions. I'm working on. Uh, ro but robot is generic, I want to say robot, but robot is generic. But for example, say I'm working on the structure, I'm working for energy, I'm working building physics, the structure, whatever. And then you, you go to get out, then people are working on social aspects and so on and so on. This is a classical way, so they won't usually, uh, it's the ways that you need to come up with rules, new rules, and if you are a PhD student, you come up with the new rules for a specific case. But with, with data-driven modeling, it, you invert the game. You just say, look for the questions and don't look at, and be open to all of these potential disciplines because a huge amount of knowledge uh, collected here. And then you do it backwards. You just say, what is the question? First, find a good question. And then, depending on your question, find a good data set. You, sometimes you need to generate your data. Sometimes data is there, and, and so on. And so in this, it's not always a big data ready. And this is always in, in media. But we don't have really, in many applications, we don't have big data. You usually have a small data set. So we do it backwards. So the, f the focus is on projects, in principle. And depending on the project, we look to two sides which kind of methods can find whatever <coughs> rules that we are interested in. And I will show you during the next sessions, one by one in different fields, that you can do this. So actually, this, this diagram is more whole carrier. So I've been running around to talk with different experts to convince them that they come up with the good questions, because I don't know the questions. So And then I think I have another view, which I call it an orthogonal view. And this is the original vision of systems engineering, or maybe many fields, many other fields like applied mathematics, I would say, also. Then you need to equip yourself with new techniques, which are generic enough. And think about, for example, differential equations. If somebody knows very well differential equations, and then you know, for example, clearly CFD, and you are in 1960s, you're the best, you have the best job because you can go, then you have flow of water, flow of energy, flow of I don't know, heat, flow of wind, and a lot of them, right? They are also similar. And then if you know CFD, you just can go to all of them. And now machine learning is another level, depending on, based on my story. Because you, you just say, I even don't care about uh, differential equations. I learn differential equations by my models. And this is happening. So this is the whole setup, and this last semester I was trying to just talk about this uh, vertical direction. Now I think it makes sense to have this kind of uh, focal point. So I will try to show you every session one one application from like this side, and then one uh, one techniques from the other side. So it will be very dense, I think, but maybe it works. I don't know. So again, another way to. Uh, Re yeah, rephrase these things that I'm pushing. I'm not trying to sell it, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I, uh, sometimes I look like a salesperson, <laughs> but I r I'm not really doing that. So you can, you, can, you can argue also against if you don't like it. It's OK. So you can think about it like, again, classical. This is what I told you about hard coding. So you have this classical pro problem, and just we learn in uh, one, one pendulum. And you know that if it's double pendulum, it's not possible to uh, find an uh, analytical answer for that. But you can uh, you can write the equations based on the classical uh, rules and equations that we know, cl classical physics uh, laws, let's call it. And then you can write it down like a simple code, and then so start from this starting point, and then define the notion of time, and then simulate it, right? If, and you can do it like here. Later you can check it. And if you visualize it, now you have this kind of pattern, which is like t I have two is a is I have two purposes for showing this. First of all, is that you can really visualize that uh, simulate the setup in a deterministic way, 
and if you and this this is the theory driven model that in reality if you know for example how water flow which is a, which is a physical system and you with a certain idealization you just say okay there is no friction it's just gravity it works and you can make a f simulation of water and here is the same you r you know the rules you write the code and you simulate it and then if you say i want to see for example what is the starting point what happens if it's water flow it works but if you have these kind of systems and this is a very interesting point it, these are chaotic systems these are deterministic unpredictable models so they are both fully deterministic but depending on the initial condition every time they go to a different way so this is, a, this is a very interesting, for example, case that, for example, when we were working with Pierre Luigi and Ole, we discovered that what they are working actually in this uh, static problem is a double pendulum problem. That when you decide in the first layer, next layer is like you have a lot of freedom and so on. So it's exactly like this. So we will go through it and look at also, I think we'll show some part of it. In maybe in one of the sessions. I don't, I have, I don't have the schedule to finalize it. So what is happening again with machine learning, and I think I should not uh, refer new papers, I would like to refer to these old works of Gauss, for example, beginning of 1900. They simply said, what if we really don't know what is the logic or what is the rules or rational behind these systems? And this was the first time they had a kind of observations from a certain meteoroid, I think, for a certain amount of time. And they simply said, that we, did, we don't know how this uh, works and this is the field of astronomy and they 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 develop this method and this is called least square method and I think this is a super concept in machine learning and this is the whole machine learning in, in principle that you just say I don't know how but I know this is my observation for example in time so I want to build a fictional uh, function is not representational. When I say representation, means that you really think about how molecules of water are moving. So you need to know all the rules and write it down as a function and then simulate it. But here this guy said, let's think about this as a kind of polynomial function with no meaning. Just add a lot of uh, variables and then say, I have observations of like 10 steps of these uh, moving uh, elements and I want to know what is the next step. So they say, let's change the game, let's build a machine and start with random parameters and say every time that we have the input that it gives us an answer and they say it's not good enough. So we just define a gauge and this is the least square error for example here, it's not a square here but in principle it's square because you have two sides of error and then you just simply say this is a function and it could be anything and this is the output. I stop I re repeat this process, and every time I have a new observations, I, I, tr I go through this m my algorithm or whatever code that I write, and I check if it's good enough or not, based on my data. And if it's valid, then I say this, this function is representing the thing. It's actually it's not representing any longer, but it's, it's able to predict what is your question. This could be all the elements of a building, and then you want to say, based on all the other data sets I, w I have, I want to know, with no argumentation, tell me what is the cost of production, for example, the cost of construction. Or, if this is the house, what's the price? Or, if this is the structure, is it, f is it stable or not? So, you need to have a lot of uh, valid data sets, and then build this machine, and then always look at the output. So, the, the rest, which is the classical expertise will be learned by the algorithm. And I think this F here is the whole machine learning. And so, because when you start about this, you realize that there are lots of ways to build these functions. So classically, for example, you, you would start with a polynomial function, which is a very uh, uh, well-formed function, and then it's a very nice parametric setup. And for example, you have this kind of uh, observations in the red ones. It could be anything. Then you just say, what if I have a first order polynomial function? And we will go through it in maybe next week, uh, how it works exactly. And then you just say, what if it's just first order? And then this is the best result you can get with this first order polynomial. And if you increase the order of your uh, polynomial, it gets better. And then if you say it gets better and better, and then it gets worse. So now this is part of building this function. And the whole contributions on all of these methods that I showed you in the beginning is how to make a better generic function. And for example, nowadays it's, it's called deep learning and it's very powerful because, because of the 
uh, storage capacity that it has. So this was like, uh, I think, usually they, nobody talks about this because you start learning this least square method when you take statistics, but later when you go to machine learning, people kill statistics. So you never learn that this is the main concept. And this is what I'm telling you, that it's not that new. These are old concepts. So now what we can, we can represent it like this, that if we remember this uh, story of uh, this guy, you can think about it that like a forward way of thinking for, for modeling. So you design these kind of uh, logical gates. And then by these logical gates, in principle, you can operate a lot of different functions, right? But this is when you have when you know if this then this if this so you you need to write it down and this is you can think about it if you write it like that is a kind of forward way so it's a hard coded uh, model so with machine learning you literally start with a random combi random network which means that oh, these are like weights imagine and this is like imagine like dot products each each arrow is a dot product and you start literally with random. And then you just say, this is my input, this is my picture, and this is output. And then you have, for example, four labels. I don't know, cats, dog, two other things. And then the first time you show a picture of cat, the system says, I think it's a, it's a dog. And you say, no, it's wrong. And this is list square, or in general, a loss function. Then you just say, next time I showed you this picture, you should learn that this is a dog, it's not a cat. right? And then you do it a lot and a lot. And then in the, this is the learning part. It learns all of these weight vectors, and it has nothing. Yeah, it's nothing more than a matrix operation. You just need to learn matrix operations, <laughs> and then you stack them like this. And deep learning is this part because it's it has a depth. If it's one layer, it's not deep. But deep learning is like in the media, yeah, right. So you should get it. But for example, there are like theoretical proof for that, that if you have one layer in the middle and one layer output, it's a, a universal approximator for any function. So if you have a really a, a data that follows a certain function and you don't know, with only with one layer, you can learn it. Just show the input and output. So think about this in any context, Rob. Now you can go everywhere, you just say, I have this data, I, for example, for movement of robot, for example. You want to move your arms, and then you just say, I don't know which temperature produces which kind of results, and so on, and which pressure, and so on. And then you need to collect a lot of data. And imagine in a very simple case, you have failed or passed, and or you have a kind of continuous value. So you just learn that this for this specific robot, for this specific room, robots should behave like that. And actually, the robots move question would be, for example, if I'm here, and then I'm sensing this, 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 what would be my next move? And this is the output, right? For example, one could be the force, one could be, I don't know, whatever the case is. So that's the whole thing. And then that's the freedom that you have. You can go to any field, of course, if you, if you like to do it like me. But if not, then it's different. So if, if this is the story, and the whole development during the last 40 years have been to develop different functions, different techniques, and we will see that there are limits in any of them. So I, I map this, which is a bit confusing. Then in principle, I think machine learning is, is evolving. So I don't believe that if you really want to use it, there is a geometric uh, explanation of machine learning to say, that's it. You should get engaged. And I think the way you learn it is like, is like a it's like learning a new language because then you will see that, for example, in this deep learning now, they really talk about like first layer convolution, second layer max pooling, and then it makes sense. You know what is happening there, and then nonlinear activation, and so on and so on. And then you need to learn a lot of terms, like which are just keywords. And if you want to become a computer scientist, which I don't think so, you, you want to do. <laughs> is you should take a kind of pedagogical path. So you need to spend like four years and take courses from uh, computer science departments. But there they don't talk about this intersection of applications. Uh, but they just start, for example, linear algebra. Maybe you already had it in bachelor. I had it, for example, linear algebra. And then you learn optimization techniques. Because here, you, you, if you are familiar with optimization, you can think about this as a kind of optimization problem. You want to minimize the error. So you have a parametric setup, 
and you just say I want to minimize this error and if you design a proper error function uh, or objective function in your optimization it finds all the decision variables or the weight vectors of this neural network so in principle you are done so there are many people who really think uh, machine learning is nothing more than optimize applied optimization actually so there are lots to learn from optimization and then also from probability theory and statistics and so on. And these are the topics that we discussed mainly in the previous uh, like semesters. But I, yeah, if you like, I, I really suggest you to take a look at them. And we have the, all the codes here and run them. But what I think would be the best way is that you, because all of you are uh, graduate students or PhD or postdoc, you really need to define a question. And if you get a question, and then depending on the question, try to try to approach this question with the machine learning, then you realize that, okay, let's start with linear regression. And then you simply see that it doesn't work. And then you go, okay, let's go to nonlinear models. And then you learn this, this, this. And then you, after maybe like one project, you learn that how to talk about this. And then when you go to another problem, you quickly say, okay, this is a kind of uh, regression problem or this kind of things. And then at the same time, this is nowadays super easy. I would, I, I would, I, for example, I wouldn't even suggest you to come to this class if you're really keen to learn it. Just take a good question, and then start learning with Scikit-Learn and uh, TensorFlow if it's in deep learning. If not, you, most of the cases I think here we are using, we don't need deep learning in my opinion. So Scikit-Learn is a super easy to use platform, and you just need to start. And they have a lot of examples. And then if you try to connect your question, whatever is that question, to this uh, machine learning, you are there. And then you will see there are lots of documentation and so on. It's done. So this is the way, I think, the proper way to learn it, if you're keen. Otherwise, by just attending to, to, to seminars or watching uh, tutorials in isolations, it doesn't work. You really need to get engaged. So for today if i just want to finalize i just wanted to mention out of these some of the some of the terms that i will try to explain them exactly in in, in, in more detail in next sessions but today you just need to know for example is a classical division in, in machine learning usually we have three kind of problems supervised learning unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning supervised learning is like kind of function approximation so when you have a certain goal and you just say, I have a lot of parameters or a lot of in input variables, I want to know what is, for example, output. For example, this could be the price, this could be stock market, this could be the final outcome of your structural pro design process, or it could be, I don't know, a next move of a robot. This is a kind of targeted question. This is called supervised because you have a target and then by, ta by this target you train. And then, the, and in principle, I think, you can say in an abstract way all the machine learning algorithms uh, problems are supervised. But when we talk about unsupervised is that when you really don't have a specific uh, uh, target for variables, but you want to know what is, for example, the, top the topology of the space that you are observing, for example. For example, the problems like clustering. If you are generating lots of uh, data set or if you have a lot of data set, for example, I don't know, in market segmentation. You have a lot of uh, data from your customers and you want to know which types of customers you have. Here you don't have a specific target, but the question is, can you group them? And grouping is, a, is called unsupervised. And reinforcement learning is, for example, when you have a kind of dynamic environments, for example, like robots, for example. When you move the move robots, you change the environments, right? When and when this environment has changed, now you need to adapt b uh, based on that. So in principle, your action is affecting the environment. This is when you get uh, to this setup of reinforcement learning. Whereas, for example, if you're predicting weather, your prediction as a one-person prediction, it doesn't change weather, right? So here you, have, you need to just learn the dynamics. But in reinforcement learning, in principle, you have questions that you are part of the game. So you, maybe you have heard about this uh, AlphaGo from DeepMind or this kind of chess playing and so on, because your action changes the game. So this is the, uh, with, uh, I would say, a tiny part of machine learning, but it's a, it's a different question. So you, you can think about it. And I suggest you to look at Wikipedia entries of all of them, not more, just Wikipedia entries of these keywords, and then just take a look quickly. And what is prediction function approximation? 
yeah, it's clear. And then you have regression. These are all the classical terms from statistics. That regression is exactly the same as functional approximation. If you go to engineering, they call it curve fitting. If you go to statistics, it's called regression. So there's always a fight between these guys. And then if you have a, a categorical output, this is called classification. For example, you just say cat or dog, or zero and one. It's not a continuous output, it's just a discrete, for example, output, but it's countable. So it's a kind of classification, for example. And for example, you have pattern recognition, which is another name for <laughs> clustering, I would say, mo mostly. And then, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't go to further to density learning, and we can talk about And actually, we have like one session only on, on density learning. Density learning is, imagine you're, you, you have a simulation, for example, and you want to know what are the boundaries of this uh, possible outcome of the simulation. So your simulation is very fast, for example. You can generate a lot of r randomized setup and then generate a lot of, for example, outputs, whatever is that output, for example, it could be flow of wind, and you change a lot these uh, uh, layouts of a building, for example, right? And then you have, imagine you, have, you don't have a speed problem. So you just quickly move them and then f uh, simulate and see what happens. So in density learning, you really want to know what are the space of possibilities. And this is important because you want to know what is the, possi the, uh, the, 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 uh, the borders of these possible outcomes. And this is a very fundamental thing, and you can easily connect it later to clustering, for example. So, yeah, space transformation is extremely important, and actually this is the whole idea of uh, this deep learning. Because, like this case, if you think about your, that your data is, are images, and then you have pixels, right? So, as, as, as humans, when we look at them, you really see that, okay, it's like, one person, but it's just rotating, like moving uh, her face, right? And then you're, you're moving the camera. But if you think about each pixel of your picture as one dimension, which is the case as an input, you need to learn a lot, and this is the whole contributions of these guys in deep learning, to learn, for example, in this case, rotation invariance. So how to capture rotation invariance? If you capture that in by some methods, then you can convert this original data set to another space, which is algebraic space, it has no, no meaning, but you just see each picture will be converted to a 200 dimensional space, where in that space, when I move in this direction, it changes the angle, ang angle of the camera, for example. So this is, this is one of the invariances that for us is easy. And then, for example, think about it as a graph, when you or any geometric form that visually when you look at it so it's the same but it depends a lot how do you represent it if you take a photo of that from backside or front side they're totally different so how this machine can learn that there is something as geometry and this is for example one of them and sometimes for example you have a scale invariance if i take a photo of myself from this distance or like from 100 if if you know me you look at the, you look at the picture and say okay i know this person but if you represent it as a picture, in one picture there are like few pixels representing my face, in the other one is a lot of them. So if you literally want to compare pixel by pixel, it doesn't work. So you need to learn this, for example, in this case, scale invariance and rotation invariance and so on. So for example, for us, this is an iPhone, this is an iPhone, and this is an iPhone also, right? But if you take photo of them and you literally check this pixels value and then try to match them, it doesn't work, right? You need to learn that there's a kind of uh, invariance here. So these are very important things, and and yeah, this is the whole history of machine learning. If you want to learn it, so I, I the last semester I tried to present it like this, but now I tr this semester I try to show it by an application, which is a meaningful application, not a toy example. So I think I had another thing. So again, you can play with that. I just I wanted to test again with this Google Ngram. For example, now here I just want to know what is the history about supervised learning. And you can do it for anything in your field. And this is a very, very valuable tool. It's a kind of uh, very fast analysis of history in your field. So if you have a question, start with this and see if you're right or not. So you can see, like, uh, I would say, these uh, correlations in time and so on. For example, supervised learning, as I expected, is not very old, <coughs> and these three are not very old, but supervised learning was like mentioned in 1910. And then 
of course the peak is now and then if you look at the other terms like this other function approximation and so on you see that they are not that new this is 1800 it's like, a it's like 200 years right <coughs> more than 200 years but this was my starting point why this is happening now maybe it's just because of computational power or Google or media <laughs> attention that everybody knows about everything and maybe that time was not like that and then look for example regression which one is reg I think this is a regression you see starting in yeah, 18, 1890s and maybe even before you see that there are some peaks small things so it's, it's really good if you look at them and for example for me the funny part was uh, not this one for example but for example for deep learning which is totally made up work in 2006 first paper this is always we talk and then ju I just did it today and I don't know is it correct or not but we have this deep learning <laughs> maybe it's because we have this notion of deep understanding or deep learning but I don't know it has a peak here in 1810 <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes down and then comes up again here which is now this is our deep learning and machine learning so sometimes there are interesting things that you don't know and I don't know what is this, of course, convolution is a kind of thing, uh, important thing. So I think there will be very few algorithms that I will present. Let's say like this one is self-organizing map, which is a very powerful technique for manifold learning. And then this random forest that by that they, 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 they succeed in all of these uh, competitions. It's simple, it's super uh, interesting, and it's, you can use it now. And I will talk about this, and also I will talk about this deep learning in convolutional autoencoders, and then I don't know recurrent neural networks, but we have the presentations from the last year, and then we will have a lot of applications with these convolutions. Now, now after these stories, I r want to repeat again that, for example, imagine when you have this as an input, uh, for example, this could be a starting point and don't think about it that these are different. It could be any dimension, right? These are abstract. So imagine you have a, a specific area of the city, and then you just want to know if it rains in different part of the city, what happens after 100, I don't know, what, after t 10 minutes, for example, or one hour. So the way you do it, the classical way, you just uh, wait for, like, if it's a real case that we are dealing with now, it takes five days to tell you what happens if it rains 10 minutes. So you have an initial condition, you say it starts from here for 10 minutes, and then you simulate, literally simulate all the flow of uh, water, and then it tells you this is the risk of, for example, flood for these buildings and this building. And then you just know, no, don't know where, where this uh, rain is happening. Maybe it will be here, maybe it's here. So in principle, as an engineer, you try to learn this generalization. So now think about this case, and I will show you, and just found this uh, nice application with a uh, Russian group, uh, uh, last week, they they train this with a lot of uh, data sets, uh, uh, like CFD based simulations, and li later what they do is that they say, take uh, just take the results after five iterations, as an input plus the gradients of the values, how water was flowing, and two pictures, and then learn what would be the outcome of that. So if you have enough number of observations. It's a, it's a kind of image labeling, right? You just say, this is a picture, and tell me where are the risk of flood. And every time you're changing the location of, for example, rain. And there is no simulation any longer, but you, you get data from, for example, a valid simulator. Or, for example, I will show you this case also, that they take data from topology optimization, because they space on gradient descent, they say, we take, it needs to be run, I mean, you need to iterate for 100 steps, but it takes a lot of time. Let's take 10 steps and then predict what would be the outcome, because it's a kind of image, pro for example, 2D is a kind of simple image uh, semantic labeling. And then it works. And then you change the initial conditions after a few observations, it learns. And it's not any longer about topology optimization. But you just focus on a specific uh, context and just say, for this specific case, I have these expensive uh, simulations, I use it properly, I sample it properly, and then feed it to another model. 
And then this machine learning learns that context, and you cannot easily generalize it. That's, that's the thing. So there are lots of applications like that. And I really uh, want to encourage you, especially for those who registered for the course, because there is a course you can register for. It. And I think everybody for sure will pass. And, and last semester, everybody was getting 5.5 because uh, if you participate. But this semester, what I would like to ask you for, especially for everyone, but especially those who registered, to at the end of the, uh, this, for example, eight or 10 sessions, come up with a nice question that you think is a good question that can be approached by machine learning. And then this could be like, I don't know, a five bullet points to say, this is my field. I think this is a problem. And it might be funny, but let's try it like this. And I don't know if we want to try it or you want to try it, but just think about it like that. And I think this will be very helpful. Otherwise, if I just talk about it, I'm, based on my experience, is that it will be a bit boring after a while. You just say, OK, another method, another method. But if you engage yourself with a specific application, and I would be extremely happy to help and to contribute also. So. Yeah, and yeah, and unfortunately, this semester I need to travel to China and Singapore two times, so it will be less number of sessions. So I will I will give you the final schedule. I think maybe next week, but I think we will have around nine to ten sessions. So I will come. I will try to f do it like this. That for example, this was introduction, and then we have, for example, least square method and some of the things and then we will go to a specific application this is a uh, web application that i developed over the last uh, two years and it was yeah it's still or under discussion with with several investors and, and then i uh, there I, I i told you i tell you about a uh, function approximation and then where to get the data from and then even yeah this kind of stuff and then we can go to ap some application in cities in urban environments and then i show you what is self-organizing maps and then, for example, then we need to spend a bit of time on these uh, uh, deep learning techniques. And they're like benchmark data sets. And then after that, we can go to convolutional neural networks. And then we can show you after that several applications, like for study of urban forms and structural design. I think this is a collaboration we did with Ola and Pierluigi and Lucas also. I think Lucas will present part of it. And then I will spend maybe one session on learning physics which will be how to uh, speed up slow C CFT simulation or in principle computational physics. And also this application, uh, which was recently done by this topology optimization. And then if we have time, I will talk about, this is not machine learning that much, but it will be about systemic risk. This is These are my work and uh, systemic risk in economic and transportation networks. There I try to bring the data set and then try to find what was the question here and what we could do. And yeah, and there are some of them, we have publications already. And just feel free, if you have another questions, bring it and we can discuss it. This would be great, for example, any of you. Yeah, because it's not just a class, it's just a place to discuss. Right? So yeah, that was it mainly from my side. I skipped this part also. Yeah, thank you.